Welcome to section 10.3, hypothesis testing for a population mean this time. Um, remember our notation for population mean, we're going to be using inferential statistics to get us information about mu. Okay, so we're going to be using the sampling distribution of the sample mean. So back from chapter 8, we know that the mean is this and the standard deviation is this. The criteria is if the sample size is large or if the population is normal, the sampling distribution is also normal. We also talked about how we run into problems um, with the standard deviation when we're on the normal curve, so we switch over to student's t distribution. This is the same stuff we did for confidence intervals for mu. Okay, so um, when we're testing hypothesis regarding a population mean, our requirements are going to be the same. Sample is obtained using a simple random sample, SRS. Um, the sample has no outliers via box plot. Here's a quick typo. N is less than 5% of N, not greater than or equal to. And then finally, the population is either normally distributed or the sample size is large. All right, so three things we have to check. So let's use this example to figure out how our hypothesis test is going to run. We have that suppose the EPA was suing the city of Rochester for noncompliance with carbon monoxide standards. Specifically, the EPA would want to show that the mean level of carbon monoxide levels in downtown Rochester's air is dangerously high, higher than 4.9 parts per million. I'm going to highlight that. Does a random sample of 22 readings with the sample results um, as follows, X bar is 5.1 and S is 1.17 parts per million, present sufficient evidence to support the EPA's claim and use alpha equals 0.05 level of significance? All right, so that's always um, a nice way to start our thinking process. Whenever we see alpha or level of significance, we know that um, we're running a hypothesis test. So we need our null and our alternative hypothesis. So that's what we have right here in step one. So our null is H0 and our alternative is H1. We're doing inferential statistics on the mean, so we need to have mu in both the null and the alternative. And what we're testing is in our problem. We're going to see if the air, the carbon monoxide levels are higher than 4.9 parts per million. So that's your alternative higher than 4.9 because remember your null statement is always the statement of equality. Okay, um, our alpha is 0 0.05. We got that from our problem. And now let's compute our test statistic. Um, we're going to be using our formula we saw at the top for students t distribution and we have it again right here. So we're going to need x bar, the mean, and then s over square root of n. Okay, so um, from the sample, we got that the mean is 5.1, and from the sample, we got that the standard deviation is 1.17. Let me show you where that is in our problem. That's this stuff. These are our sample results. And now we're going to find the test statistic. So we need the mean of the t distribution, which we're getting from the null hypothesis, and the standard deviation is s over the square root of n. And we're given s, and n is our population size. I also, there's another typo here, guys. Um, there should be a divided sign. It's standard deviation divided by the square root of n. All right, and so our test statistic is 0.80. So remember, this is what we're going to do with this test statistic. So creating a student's t distribution, assuming that the mean is 4.9, is this 0 0.8 unusual? All right, so let's write out some thoughts on that. So is this unusual? Is t not unusual? And we define unusual events um, based on alpha. Alpha is 0 
So is the probability of T naught occurring less than 0 0.05? Um, another way of saying that same thing, if something's unusual, um, it would be unusual if it was in the critical region. So is T naught in the critical region, the reject zone? And the uh, alpha determines the critical region on the curve created by the null hypothesis. All right, and if something is in the critical region, so all these statements are um, equivalent, we call it statistically significant. So is T naught statistically significant? So that's really what we're doing when we're running this hypothesis test. Okay, so let's, let's carry on. Let's see how we're going to answer that question. How are we going to figure out if it is in the critical region? Well, just like we did in 10.2, we're going to use the classical approach or the p-value approach. So the classical approach is we focus on values. So um, the critical region, first of all, it's the alternative hypothesis was greater than, so it's a right-tailed test. And that's what we have right here. It's The critical region is going to be in the right-hand tail because it's a right-tailed test. So what we have to do, we have to go to our chart that we've looked at for Chapter 9, and the critical value, um, the sample size was 22. So that means degrees of freedom is 21, and area in the right is alpha. So it's 0 0.05. So looking at our table, we're going to get that the critical value is 1.72. And that's what we have right here. It's 1.72. So this is your T sub alpha. And alpha is that area to the right. And we see that this area to the right is 0 0.05. So we found the critical value. It marks the reject zone. Where is our test statistic? Our test statistic is 0 0.8. It's to the left of the critical region. So are we in the reject zone? No. So what's our conclusion? Um, do not reject. So that's how we determine if our test statistic T naught is in the critical region using the classical approach. Um, the p-value approach is probably the one you guys are going to like to use. p-value approach, we look at the probability. p-value is the probability of getting as extreme or more extreme a value than the test statistic. So since it's a right-tailed test, that means area to the right of t naught. Okay, so that's how we're determining our p-value. Um, so we could, you know, definitely use our calculator or the appendix. Remember, probability is area. Um, and we would get the p-value through the table. Table of value shows the areas as this, 0.2163. And I'll show you an easier way to calculate the p-value in just a second. But just like in 10.2, we're going to take the p-value and we compare it to what? We compare it to alpha. Alpha is our cutoff mark for unusual events. So anything less than alpha, we're going to say it's unusual, we're going to reject the whole curve, we're going to reject the null. Um, but this time our p-value is bigger. So remember if the p-value is low, the null must go. But this time the p-value is not low. So the null is not going to go. So again, the p-value is not smaller than the level of significance, so we do not reject the null. Do not reject the null. All right, and we um, are coming up with the same conclusion as before using the classical approach, and the conclusion was we're not going to reject the null. So remember, you can use either the classical approach or the p-value approach. 
Um, p-value approach is normally a little bit easier because we have calculator functions that can do a lot of this for us. All right, so however you slice it, do not reject the null. And then if we do not reject, what kind of evidence do we have? We have insufficient evidence. We have insufficient evidence at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance to conclude the alternative that the mean carbon monoxide level is higher than 4.9. Oh, and I believe that was 4.9 parts per million. So I'll just do P parts per million. Okay. So good. So the hypothesis test is essentially run the same way as it was in 10.2 with the proportion. The only thing different is we're using student T distribution. Um, but even our logic is the same, right? If the p-value is low, the null must go. And we have these two um, scenarios. So if we do not reject, if the p-value is low, So if the p-value is low, so less than alpha, our logic, again, is to reject. If the p-value is low, the null must go. So we reject the null. So what kind of evidence do we have to support the alternative? We have sufficient evidence. So that's how our, our line of thinking works. Um, and remember, as far as our uh, conclusion, we always state the kind of evidence we state the level of significance, and then we conclude the alternative, always. Okay, so we have sufficient evidence to conclude the alternative if we reject the null. The other scenario that we're gonna have is if the p-value, and that's what we just did in this example, the p-value was bigger than alpha. If that's the case, we do not reject the null And if we do not reject the null, can we support the alternative? No. So we found insufficient evidence to support the alternative. Okay? So that's how our logic works for all these hypothesis tests. So um, let's see an easier way to find our p-value. Um, to find the p-value, we are going to need a calculator function, and our calculator function is going to be called t-test. So let's take a quick break. Let's look at our calculator video, and we'll figure out how to run a t-test. <laughs> 